Hey, people. Um, firstly, I have to apologize because I've messed up. Um, Lord Palmerston was not 27th Prime Minister. He was 28th Prime Minister. I've already amended that in the title. I should have been making this video first on Lord Aberdeen. Um, but you'll forgive me because Aberdeen is, frankly, quite an obscure figure compared to the political giant that was Palmerston. And perhaps that's slightly unfair on Aberdeen because I'm just looking at the Wikipedia article here in preparation for this video. And um, he actually had quite a lot of esteem in his ministerial positions. He was certainly a high riser in his early years. Um, just looking at the start here. Well, first of all, just to give you biographical. Um, George Hamilton Gordon, the fourth Earl of Aberdeen, was born in 1784 in Edinburgh, Midlothian. And he's actually one of uh, seven prime ministers from Scotland. Uh, and there's at least 10 of Scottish descent. Um, that would make him the second Scottish prime minister, I believe, after um, the Earl of Butte. Um, so he was born in Edinburgh, uh, as was Tony Blair, incidentally. Um, he was the eldest son of George Gordon, Lord Haddo. Um, so they came from quite a prominent Edinburgh family. Um, he's been styled as the first Peelite and only Peelite Prime Minister Bar Peel himself. Um, so he's not uh, correlated, or that's the wrong word, he's not um, connected really to the Tories or the Whigs in the same way. So in that sense, he does stand out. But one thing I've just been reading on Wikipedia, and I'll just read this quickly because it is quite interesting. After the death of his wife in 1812, he became a diplomat almost immediately being given the important embassy to Vienna while still in his 20s, bearing in mind that Austria-Hungary was still a major part at this time. Um, his rise in politics was equally rapid and lucky. He had two accidents, Canning's death and Wellington's impulsive acceptance of the Canningite resignations, led to him becoming Foreign Secretary to the Duke of Wellington in 1828, despite an almost ludicrous lack of official experience. So obviously Wellington held him in high regard. It being a minister for less than six months, so when you think about this, to be a minister for less than six months and be propelled into one of the great offices of state is quite something. So perhaps some of Aberdeen's flaws can be explained by being thrown into the deep end. After holding the position for two years, followed by another cabinet role, by 1841 his experience led to his appointment as foreign secretary again under Robert Peel for a longer term. This was despite him being a notoriously bad speaker, which mattered far less in the House of Lords and having a dour, awkward, occasionally sarcastic exterior. Nonetheless, his Peelite colleague, later himself Prime Minister, uh, William York Gladstone, said of him that he was the man in public life of all others whom I have loved. I say emphatically loved. I have loved, it, loved others, but never like him. So maybe we should be a little bit more fair on Aberdeen, given that he was held in high regard by such great men as Wellington and Gladstone. And um, that's just a thought. Um, so uh, he was Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs under uh, Peel and Wellington. He was also Secretary of State for War in the Colonies under Peel. He was Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster under Wellington. And he was, just trying to find a seat, I haven't done this with every Prime Minister. Um, nope, uh, I can't find his own seat. Uh, bearing in mind, uh, like I could say, the this was just after the period of rotten boroughs, but um, the seats weren't as they are today. Um, there's not very many pictures available of Aberdeen. There's one daguerreotype showing sort of a door looking older man, uh, which is pretty much like the Victorian mannerisms. If you look at most British 19th century prime ministers, they all look absolutely miserable, but that is the nature of Victorian photographs. They were sort of encouraged not to smile. I guess it was to try and look serious and diplomatic. Um, one thing that dominated his time in office was the Eastern Question. This is basically the rise of the Russian Empire, um, the so-called Great Game. Um, and uh, some things that basically there was a number of events that led up to this rise in power of the Russian Empire. But uh, the thing that really, really stuck out during Aberdeen's time in office was the very bloody Crimean War, which uh, by a sad coincidence is the same ground it's basically being fought today in the Donbass War. Um, 
the charge of the Light Brigade um, was part of the famous Battle of Balaclava. Um, and this is uh, another famous battle of that um, campaign was the Battle of Inkerman. Crimean stands out because there was a, quite a large number of Victoria Crosses won during the war. In fact, I believe, unless I'm mistaken, the Victoria Cross was designated and created in light of this war. Um, the charge of the Light Brigade is seen as a catastrophe for the British, um, and it's best remembered by a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, um, who was the Victorian Poet Laureate. Um, just a few quick words on Aberdeen from the Downing Street website. Here's a quotation from him. I do not know how I shall bear being out of office. I have many resources, and many objects of interest, but after being occupied with great affairs, it is not easy to subside the devil of common occupations. So this was clearly a man who loved politics. He was driven by politics. Um, and as that says, he found it hard to be out of office. Um, it said he had an eventful young life. Orphaned as a child, he toured Europe as a young man, visiting many classical sites. Returning to his Scottish estates in 1805, he was shocked at their condition in the lives of his countrymen, in contrast to the life he'd known in the south of England. Um, so he, he was a man of culture, quite privileged, um, and clearly driven by... I get the impression from this, um, with the limited sources available, he was a decent man, he tried to do the right thing, but perhaps like Russell, he was weighed down by a number of flaws. Um, when Derby's government was defeated in 1852, the Earl of Aberdeen became Prime Minister of a coalition government of Peelites, Whigs, Radicals and Irish nationalists, Irish members, I should say. Um, his cabinet was packed with talent. He had some real heavyweights in there. Russell uh, was his foreign secretary, Palmerston was his home secretary, Gladstone was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, but controlling such big personalities proved difficult for him, and that's often the case. When you have a cabinet that's full of heavyweights, uh, the prime minister can find himself or herself um, overshadowed. Um, early in his time in office, uh, he managed to pass legislation concerning taxation, the civil service and legal matters, which showed his ability at reform. Yet his government was dominated by foreign affairs as we were dragged into the Crimean War, which France was also heavily involved in. Um, Lawrence Nightingale, of course, became prominent during that conflict. Responsibility for failing to manage the Crimean War efficiently was penned on Aberdeen personally, whether fairly or unfairly, but I think this indicates the, the weight that the Prime Ministerial Office had at this point, whereby it wasn't penned on the monarch, but on the Prime Minister. So this really was a period of constitutional monarchy. Uh, responsibility for failing to manage it, well, yeah, I've just read that. Um, so that's Aberdeen, a man who had some talent, who certainly had a promising career in his early years, but uh, as Prime Minister, we can't say that he was a great Prime Minister. Um, there isn't really much more to say about Aberdeen. Um, he has actually been featured in some media, which surprises me. The novel Black Beauty by Anna Sewell includes a horse named Captain, who previously taken part, well, that's, that's not to do with Aberdeen personally. Two war movies were made, both entitled The Charge of the Light Brigade, the 1936 version uh, starring Errol Flynn and the 1968 version. Um, and uh, it doesn't mention though if anyone played Aberdeen in those roles. Flashman at the Charge, again, I mentioned Flashman in the Palmerston video, uh, featured Aberdeen. Um, but yeah, he's not one of our better known uh, prime ministers. Um, I believe, um, well, yeah, I was going to say he was the last prime minister to be named after a city, but that's not the case. It was the Marcus of Salisbury uh, later on. Of course, Salisbury is a city in Wiltshire. Um, so that's Aberdeen. Um, certainly not an outstanding prime minister, but like Russell, perhaps weighed down by circumstance. Um, 